today we're going to be speaking about provenance and social science data. Um, so you should be able to see on our screen we're showing our data provenance um, community page uh, and we have a data provenance interest group and if you're interested in that um, you can contact us through the contacts on that um, page. We have our speakers here. Um, I'm Kate LeMay, I'm from ANS and I'm one of the research data specialists at ANS and we have George Alter, Steve McGeckin and Nicholas Carr. We'll give each of them a little bit of an intro when uh, we get to um, their point in speaking. So as I mentioned, this is part of a series. Today's our first one. So I'd like to introduce Steve and Nick who will be speaking first. So Steve is the Director of the Australian Data Archive at the Australian National University. He holds a PhD in Industrial Relations and a Graduate Diploma in Management Information Systems and has research interests in data management and archiving, community and social attitude surveys, new data collection methods and reproducible research methods. Steve has been involved in various professional associations in survey research and data archiving over the last 10 years and is currently chair of the executive board of the Data Documentation Initiative. And Nick, um, Nicholas Carr, is the data architect for Geosciences Australia, um, GA. In that role, he designs and helps build enterprise data platforms. GA is particularly interested in the transparency and repeatability of its science and the data products it delivers. For this re these reasons, Nick implements provenance modelling and management systems in order to represent and store information about data lineage, what was done and who did it and what they used to do it. Previous to working at GA, Nick was an experimental scientist at CSIRO and researched metadata systems, provenance, data management and linked data. He currently co-chairs the International Research Data Alliance's Research Data Provenance Interest Group, which the ANS provenance uh, which the Antiprovenance Interest Group works with and through that and other groups assists organisations with provenance management adoption. Okay, thanks Kate. Alright, so this is a very uh, quick introduction to uh, PROV. So PROV is, um, is, a, is a provenance standard um, and what you see on that first slide there is a very, very simple diagram of a little provenance network and I'll discuss some of that as we go. So it's not just a frivolous diagram, it's actually, it actually has some meaning. Okay, so the outline for today, so what is PROV? I'm just going to mention that very quickly um, and then I'm going to get to how do I actually use this thing um, in a couple of different ways. Um, and so first I'll talk about modelling, then I'll talk about how do I actually manage the data once I've collected or, or made PROV provenance data and then I'll talk about using PROV with other systems. So what is PROV? So PROV is a, a W3C recommendation. So W3C is the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, so it's the uh, one of the governing bodies of internet standards um, and they don't issue any documents called standards, they issue documents called recommendations. So um, PROV is a recommendation, it's its top level of standard I suppose. Um, other standards by the W3C are things like HTML, so um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with HTML at least to some extent. PROV itself uh, was, uh, was completed in 2013 and sort of formalised by the end of that year, so it's only a couple of years old, um, and a large number of authors were involved um, in PROV. There were several initiatives to make uh, provenance standards before PROV uh, over the last perhaps 20 years, and many of the authors uh, involved in those standards such as PML and OPM, I'm not going to elaborate all that, <coughs> so if you're interested in those previous standards, just, just Google them. Uh, many of the authors involved in those initiatives were involved with PROV, um, so PROV really does know about those other initiatives and um, uh, it's simpler than those precursors um, because it's trying to do a sort of a high level standard. It doesn't do as many of the tasks that those uh, precursors do, uh, but it certainly represents the, the very important bits that they, they came up with. Um, another thing to say about PROV is there's no version 2 planned anytime soon. Why am I bringing this up, this up now? Well, it's a pain for people to have to deal with standards and then version 2s and 3s and 4s of standards. Um, PROV doesn't quite operate like that and I'll explain how. Um, it is what it is um, and uh, there are ways to extend it and use it in different circumstances but it's unlikely we're going to see any version change in the next uh, few years I would think. And it's seen good adoption. Uh, PROV is really the only international broad scale provenance standard um, and uh, as a result uh, people are happy to, I think, happy to adopt it in lieu of really anything else. Right, so PROV is actually a collection of documents and I've just listed them there. I'm not going to go through them all in great detail. 
Um, but there is a, an overview document um, uh, and then certain bits and pieces which are actual recommendations or standards and additional things that just help you use uh, the PROV thing. Now the main document is the PROV DM, the data model, and that tells you what PROV contains, uh, how its classes operate and so on. And then there's a series of documents like an XML version of PROV, an OWL ontology version and special notations and so on. The only other one I'll mention is the PROV constraints, which is a list of things, of rules that um, PROV compliant chunks of data must adhere to, and that works across any um, formulation of PROV. And I'll provide a link there to the, uh, to the collection of standards uh, of, of documents. All right, so how do I use PROV? This is the, this is the modeling. How do I actually model something uh, using PROV uh, to do the core of provenance representation? Well, I'm starting off with some negatives, so don't do it like this. Don't take a, a document for something, perhaps a, a metadata um, catalog entry, um, and expect to shove a bunch of information into some field within that document. Um, so ISO 19115 is a standard for spatial data sets, and it's got a field called lineage, and some people expect to take uh, prov, uh, provenance information and stick it in that lineage field. Don't do that. Prov doesn't let you do that. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. So that's one thing not to do. We're not going to see a single item's metadata record containing a bunch of provenance information. You could do that, but not recommended. What else should I not do? So this diagram here is the class model of the DCAT, the data catalog vocabulary, which is a very generic metadata uh, model. Um, it's used uh, in relation to things like Dublin Core and various catalog style things. And we're not going to link a data set or any other object in DCAT or Dublin Core or other standards like that to a class of provenance information. And this is true for Steve's DDI initiative as well. We're not going to take objects in DDI and link to a provenance object that tells you the provenance of that object. That's an anti-pattern right there. Okay, so what are we going to do? Oh, and we don't even do this using Dublin Core's provenance property. So Dublin Core vocabulary has a property called provenance and the, the wording for that says use this to describe lineage and history. Prov doesn't want you to do that. Exactly like that. What does Prov want you to do? Prov wants you to think of everything that you're interested in in terms of three general classes of objects. So is the scenario and the things that you're interested in, are they things? Are they entities? Are they occurrences? Are they processes? Are they activities? Or are they causative people or organizations, which Prov call, calls an agent? So Prov says model everything you know about using those three classes and then link them together. And that's what, that's what Prov is all about. So how does GA use Prov? So we often process chunks of data at GA. Um, and so we have a very simple model that's using the provenance ontology. And it looks like this. There's some process. The process generates outputs. The outputs are entities. The process itself is an activity. Um, and then there's data and code and configuration and so on that feed into that process. And those are also entities. Finally, the uh, process and the entities might be related to a system and even a person who, uh, who operates that system. So that's the model we use. Okay, so how do I actually manage the data that I get in uh, provenance or that I get according to prov? Well, you can create reports. So if you go and do something, uh, a human or a system could log what they've done and they could store that information in a, a, some kind of database uh, according to the prov model. Um, and then you can, it's a document database, but you can, you can query that thing. Um, so you, you, we often have systems that sort of send reports every time they run. And you might have a form that looks like any other metadata entry form where you fill in details and you hit enter, and that sends off provenance information. But again, it's not storing it uh, with respect to one specific object. It's linking existing objects together. So some data set that is produced from another data set is going to link those two things together. Uh, for catalog things, we can, um, uh, we can link things again. And if we have a catalog that has a data set A or X and a data set Y, and we want to show there's a linking, we can say data set Y was derived from data set X and record that information somewhere. Now, data set Y may record I come from data set X, uh, but that's just a very simple little bit of provenance information. It's not a whole blob of provenance information stored within data set Y. Um, and we can ensure that any system uh, that has information that is provenance information, like who the creator of a data set was, does so in accordance to the prov model. So in this case, if we had a data set that had a creator, uh, we would say the data set was associated with an agent, and the agent had a, ro a role to play, and that role in this case was creator. That's, that's now a prov expression of that relationship. And for databases, 
uh, it can be very difficult. I can't explain it in depth here, but there's many ways in which databases could uh, could store provenance or provolated provenance information, um, but they would need to be able to show that they can actually export uh, their content, their provenance content, according to the PROV data model. You actually have to prove that if you want to say that you're compliant with the standards. Okay, so fairly quickly, how do I get PROV to work with other systems? Well, we can fully align our system, whatever the system is. So I've used a theoretical example of metadata system X. How do I align metadata system X with PROV? I could classify all the things in metadata system X according to PROV. Requires a metadata model for metadata system X. Um, sorry, a data model, not just encoding formats. We can't just deal with uh, XMLs and so on. We actually have to have a conceptual model, and then we can say this class of thing in metadata system X is the same as this class of thing in PROV. Now, PROV's only got a few classes, um, so that's that's usually pretty easy to do. Um, but it will definitely prompt you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. You may have to tease apart some of the objects that you know and love into things that PROV recognizes as different objects. You could do a partial alignment. You could take your metadata system X and only acknowledge that some of the things in that scenario are PROV uh, understood things. So maybe you've got a metadata model that talks about all kinds of stuff, and one of the things it talks about is a data set, and you say, uh, your data set is um, the same as what PROV thinks of as an entity, and maybe you ignore all the other things. Um, you would still need to demonstrate that you could extract valid PROV out of that and not all the other stuff, uh, but that would, be, that would be one way to do it. Um, and you could also link to things not in your own data model um, if you also classified those things according to PROV. Uh, the last scenario you could think about is to just deprecate your obviously not as good systems uh, and use PROV. Um, and that would require you perhaps to make either a new data set of provenance information or a data store and put that information somewhere. And that's it. Thank you very much, Nick. So, so we'll move on to Steve. Nick's talked about the sort of the general PROV model that um, that has you know, sort of is increasingly getting used in, in various different spaces. I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about the various ways of thinking about provenance in what we're doing in the social sciences and particularly using it within the standard that we um, that we utilise, and I'm now the, uh, the director for the Data Documentation Initiative. Part of the reason we, we've sort of connected these two together is we, we're now looking at how we can leverage the prompt standard inside DDI in point of fact. So uh, Nick and I and a group of others have been working on how we might go about this. I, I'm not going to touch too much on that, uh, but I'll, I'll return to that at the end. I sort of want to talk more generally about how we might think about provenance in uh, at different stages in the data life cycle, different stages in the researcher and the, um, the data management experience and how we progressed thinking about provenance you know, over that time, um, just to give us a sense of well, what sort of things we can do already uh, and how can we increasingly you know, embed you know, capture a provenance in, in what we do. Okay, I'm quickly, and for those who don't know, um, the Australian Data Archive, um, we've had a various names over time, we're going to do a quick introduction. Uh, we've been around for, for a little while now, um, based here at the Research School of Social Sciences at ANU, uh, and our mission is to collect and preserve Australian social science data on behalf of the social science research community in Australia and internationally. Now, we have, we've sort of developed a collection of you know, over 5,000 data sets now, over um, 1,500 different studies, as we call them, or projects, uh, lots of different sources, lots of different provenance um, from various different um, locations, academic, government, and private sector. Um, so. Uh, as our holdings have developed, our understanding of provenance um, has developed you know, probably alongside that. Maybe we didn't call it that at the time, but you know, over 35 years, I think that's always been sort of underpinning a lot of what we've done. And is helping researchers, who might be the secondary users of our data, um, to know where did this come from, what was it used for, and you know, how might I use it in the future is, is really the emphasis there. For those who don't really know what we're talking about, when, we used, when I use the term data archive, um, it, we're using the term of trusted systems out of a, uh, a project done by the, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, uh, kind of the equivalent uh, in Canada for the, the ARC. Um, accessible and comprehensive service, empowering researchers to locate, request, retrieve, and use data resources so you've got to be able to find it and understand it in a simple, simple seamless, and cost effective way, while at the same time protecting privacy, confidentiality, and intellectual property rights of those involved. And part of why we're interested in provenance is really that last point. You know, um, one is to help researchers understand where this came from, but B is to sort of recognise and, and uh, acknowledge the intellectual property that's been developed in those resources over time. 
Okay, so I'm going to give a, a, a brief introduction to the, the DDI standard and its different flavours. Um, as Nick pointed out, having multiple versions is not always much fun. Uh, we're up to version 4, we're about 20 years old now, so I think that's not too bad from Nick's point of view. And, and how we've sort of captured what we might think of as you know, different forms of provenance over, over time. So I've got the website there, the ddialliance.org um, website, if you're interested in knowing more. Um, the, you, know, you can go and explore the different versions of the standard there. Um, so what is DDI? I say it's a structured metadata specification developed you know, for the community and by the community. Um, so particularly the social science data archives that in, exist in most OECD countries. Uh, it's used in about 90 different countries around the world now thanks to work by the World Bank and the, um, uh, the World Health Organization and others. Uh, and there's two major development lines that are basically XML schemas. One's DDI Codebook uh, and the other DDI Lifecycle, which kind of correspond to version 2 and version 3 of the standard. Um, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, we have some other elements to it as well, um, additional specifications, uh, including some control vocabularies, um, often for things like uh, encoding methodology, um, type, you know, data types, um, and, and uh, data capture uh, processes, uh, and some RDF vocabularies so that we can sort of start moving into a linked data world um, so you can leverage the, the, the standard, particularly the lifecycle standard, uh, into a, a linked data environment. The current, the, the version 4 is, is in development at the moment, has been over the last couple of years, and that's where uh, the work with Nick has um, sort of come on board as well. Uh, it's moving to a model-based specification, so rather than being based in a you know, particular schema, uh, we're looking sort of to focus on the, the, the model uh, and then its expression into various different uh, formats. The provisional ones at this point are XML and RDF, uh, and that includes support for provenance and process models. So we're looking at that point at the how do we you know, leverage um, what, what we know from Prov uh, to support the provenance model within uh, the, new, the new version of the standard. And it's managed by the DDI Alliance. The, so, so briefly on the two versions of the, um, of the standard that are already in place. So it's been around um, in the codebook format, which has its origins uh, in the print codebooks that were produced by organisations like uh, George's, going right back to the 1960s and 70s. Um, so we sort of formalised in the social science as a fairly structured way of thinking about describing data uh, about well, 40 years ago, really. Uh, so the codebook version of the standard really is for an after-the-fact description of what this data set, a data set is about. It includes four basic sections, the document description, which is describing the document that's describing the, 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 the data set, uh, a study description, uh, we use the term study to describe sort of the package of data sets that um, uh, encapsulate a project, so that includes characteristics of the study itself that the DDI is describing, that includes lots of you know, sections on um, uh, authorship, citation, um, access conditions, uh, but particularly from the, from the point of view of provenance, um, we have their methodological uh, content, data collection processes, uh, sources, uh, and then we also include a lot of what we call related materials, uh, documents associated with the project. We'll tell you something about the provenance of, of where it came from. This includes all the questionnaires, previous code books, technical reports, etc. So from a human point of view, you're starting to get into the area of you know, thinking about provenance, even though it's not really a machine actionable version of that. We also describe the, the files themselves, the, the characteristics of the physical data files, data formats, etc., um, the size and their structure, uh, and then what we call variable descriptions, descriptions of the, the, the variables that are included in the data file. The simplest way of thinking about this is you know, uh, the columns of a, of a tabular data set. Um, what does that column mean? Because in you know, a lot of the social sciences, a column, a number is not represent actually a number, it represents a characteristic of some sort. Uh, for example, a, a five point agree, disagree scale in a survey. How do you interpret a lot of those becomes important. And George is going to talk to a, a specific project um, looking at um, uh, how we do a lot more with the variable description and the properties of variables um, uh, in, in a moment. The, so the code book was, was really described, described things, uh, developed to describe things after the fact. Um, the DDI lifecycle model takes a more um, data lifecycle approach to thinking about um, capturing metadata uh, and provenance. Uh, and underlying it is the, the, uh, the model we have on screen here. 
Um, I mean, this is you know, just a, a working model of describing the different processes um, within the DDI framework that a, a data set can go through. Everything from conceptualising the study in the first place through um, collection and processing uh, and distribution, uh, as a sideline archiving that data and storing it away for future use, uh, and then rediscovery and analysis and repurposing into the future. So it was built with the intent of, of reusability and particularly machine actionability as well. Um, so that um, the metadata that's developed in a, uh, in a data set can be reused in the future for, for the same purpose, a similar purpose, or something entirely new. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to be able to understand where did it come from. So embedded in that is generating metadata going forward, but be able to look backwards through the life cycle as well. So, as I say, it was focused on metadata reuse, um, and that reuse of metadata really implies you know, a, a provenance and you know, expectation. So why, why DDI lifecycle, the things it can do, it's machine actionable, um, it's more complex, um, there are 27 different schemas, it's probably overly concept complex um, if, we're, if we're being fair. It's structured and, uh, and identifiable, so every metadata item is actually able to be you know, permanently identified, managed uh, and repurposed if, that, if that's required. It supports related standards and it supports reuse across different projects, uh, and again that's sort of something that George is going to touch on as well. I'll move past this because I think it, it, um, there are some particular features for it that I can refer back to in, in the future. But I want to talk very briefly about how do we think about prominence within the, the different versions uh, and then pass to George to sort of talk specifically about one of the, the projects there. So if we think about how prominence has been supported here, I mean Nick's, Nick's approach to the, the prop model is really a machine actionable model uh, fundamentally. Um, DDI Codebook is not really you know, designed for that, but it is designed at least to be able to describe you know, to a human reading a catalogue entry, what's you know what the provenance of this data set was. So it includes attribution, methodology, data processing, collection, and all the documentation we, we can find on what happened to the data. But it doesn't really do that you know as sort of an automated way. It's really focusing on you know a, a human response you know to for a researcher to be able to come back and have a look. Similarly with variables, question text, where the name, what the value labels mean are, are all there. The DDI lifecycle is really trying to, you know, is the, it was our first attempt really to look at sort of the machine actionable provenance. So can we capture this along the way or it represents again the information from the, the studies, um, attribution methodology and so forth, but particularly with variables, uh, it's really trying to look at the reusable elements of, of um, how we might reuse questions, uh, reuse columns of data uh, and understand and reuse the, the basic conceptual ideas that, that are embedded within that. So, for example, if you've got a, a, a variable measuring employment, can I reuse that employment? Um, maybe the, the, um, the categorization that was used, the numbers that were used in the survey, and so forth. And then where we're going with DDI 4, um, our sort of our tagline for that is what we're calling as DDI views. Um, is can I, you know, to what extent can I actually embed a, a provenance model inside um, that framework? So now we're moving towards, you know, a, you know really recognizing the, the, the importance of provenance. Um, both conceptually and in sort of the physical and digital um, formats of, of, of data as well. Managing codes and categories uh, across the life cycle. For example, managing what you know, provenance through missing values. If, you're, if your value of a, of, a, of a datum changes, how do I understand that? Um, yeah, so that we've got really, um, we're able to generate this out um, automatically. What happened to it you know, at, at the level of an individual datum or of a variable uh, or, or of a data set? So we're moving progressively towards the sort of framework that, uh, that, that Nick described, but I say that that requires the, the management of the metadata that we have um, to be moved forward. That's quite a bit from me. Hi everyone. Thanks very much to Ant and to uh, uh, ADA for inviting me to be here. What I'm going to talk about today is a project that started in October with funding from the U.S. Uh, National Science Foundation uh, about capturing metadata during the process of, of data creation. So uh, uh, I don't think for this audience I have to uh, go into this uh, justify metadata, but um, the, the big problem is, that we face is how do we actually get the metadata? Um, it, that's often more difficult than, than we, you know, it's a lot easier to describe it than it is to get it, to actually get it most of the time. So to give you some backgrounds, I'm going to put this in the context of my home institution, which is the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, 
at, located at the University of Michigan. We've been uh, in the business of archiving social science data since 1962, and we're an international consortium of more than 760 institutions. We were also one of the founding members of the Data Documentation Initiative Alliance, which Steve just talked about, and we, we actually provide the home office for the DDI Alliance. And ICBSR has uh, been using DDI for many years, but we're now getting to the point where we're able to build new kinds of tools that take advantage of DDI. Uh, one of the first things that we've been doing, which we've been doing for at least 10 years, is that when you download data from ICPSR, you get with it a codebook in PDF. But the PDF is actually created from the DDI, not the other way around. So uh, for us, the, the DDI is the native version of, of the metadata. So what we've been do, started to do is to take advantage of DDI to build new kinds of tools. And one of the first ones we created was uh, what's called our variable search page, where you can put in a, a search term and look for questions that have been used in data sets uh, that are uh, like that uh, search term. So this is uh, an example of the results that come out of a variable search. And we are now searching over more than 4.5 million variables in about uh, 5,000 um, uh, studies or data collections. Um, one of the things that DDI makes possible is that we can go from this search to other characteristics uh, of the data. So. Uh, you can see here in, in the blue that, that there are a number of things that are hyperlinked. If you click on, where I, on the place I've got circled, it takes you to an online codebook. And uh, the online uh, codebook has a number of features. It tells you the, the question that was asked. It tells you how it was coded. If the data are available online, you can go to a cross-tab tool. And it also can link to online, uh, an online graphing tool. And the other thing that you see on the, the left side of the screen is a list of the other variables in the data set. So you can move around in the data set, and, and clicking on, on any of those variables will bring up uh, a, a display that's similar to this. Another thing you can do from our variable search screen is that if you click on the check, check, these check boxes on the left, you can pick out a certain number of variables that you want to, uh, to look at more closely. And uh, clicking on this com the compare, compare button at the top there brings you to this screen, which is a side-by-side -side comparison of these uh, different uh, variables which come from uh, different studies. And so you can see whether they're asking the same question, whether they're coded the same or differently. And uh, as before, um, this screen is also uh, hyperlinked to the online codebook. So you can go back and forth. Um, one of our more recent tools, which um, I think is, is one of the most powerful, is that you can now search for data sets that include more than one variable that you're interested in. So this is a, a search in using what we call our variable relevance search that's actually in the study search rather than the variable search, where we're looking for um, three variables about three different things. Does the respondent read newspapers? Do they volunteer in schools? Uh, what's their race? And you can see here that the results come out in um, three different columns within each study so you can see which variables are present in each study. And uh, as before, everything is hyperlinked to, to both the online codebook and the variable comparison. So you can check on any combination of these variables and, and compare them uh, side by side. Well, another thing that we did as uh, another previous NSF project, working with the American National Election Study, 
and the uh, general social survey, we made a crosswalk of the variables that are available in those two studies. Now, the American National Election Study started in 1948 and is done every four years. The General Social Survey started in 1972 and is done every two years. So we're actually going to be looking over 70 different um, data sets. And what we've done is created this crosswalk where we've grouped the variables uh, according to certain tags. Um, we've got eight lists of tags and then 100, 134 tags um, in total. The columns here, each column represents a data set and there are 70 data sets. All of the variables are linked here and I can't actually show it here, but if you hover over one of those variables, it shows you the question text uh, for the variable. And uh, again, you can use the checkboxes to pick out things that you want to compare and go to the variable comparison screen. So this is a, a, a crosswalk like this is a tool that's actually very common. You've uh, probably seen these, these before. Well, there are two things that are different about this though. One is that this is all keyed into the online codebook, so you can go transparently back and forth. The other thing is that we can use this tool to crosswalk any of the four and a half million variables in the ICPSR collection because this is drawing directly from our store of DDI metadata and we don't have to build a separate tool for each one. This one tool works over all of, all of these uh, data sets. Now, another thing that we did in this project was to think about how we could extend the online codebook. And so here's uh, our online codebook that you saw before which has the question text and and how it was coded, but uh, this version has something new in this location here. It shows how you got to this question. In big surveys, uh, every respondent doesn't answer every question. There are what are often called skip patterns. So, you know, you get asked what your marital status is, and if you're single, you go to one question. If you're married, you go to another question. Divorced people go to, go to a third pattern. So there are, there are different pathways through the, the questionnaire. And what we've done here is tried to show, here's how you got to that question, which explains why some people didn't answer the question. We also represented it in words down here. So we, um, we built this and you know, we were uh, quite proud of ourselves for, for building it. Um, because this does answer the, the question um, about who answered this question in the, in the survey. But then we ran into a problem. So how do we know who answered the question in the survey? And the answer is that we get that information from the data providers in a PDF. And the only way we could build this demo prototype was to have one of our staff members enter this program flow information by manually into uh, XML for one of data sets so we could show how this works. So we, we uh, showed a tool that we think is, is you know, really useful, but we reached a, 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 a roadblock because we don't actually get machine actionable metadata about this kind of information. And the problem is that when the data arrive at, at the archive, they don't have the question text. That's something that we at ICPSR and at ADA have to type in. They don't have the interview flow. They don't have any information about variable uh, provenance. And variables that are created out of other variables are, are not documented. So the project we're working on now, which we call C2 metadata for continuous capture of metadata, is about how do you get that. And to understand that, how we get it, you have to think about how the data are created and what happens. So first of all, the data themselves are actually born digital. People do not go around with a paper questionnaire these days. Um, they use these computer-assisted interview uh, programs. They're on tele telephone or, or they go around with a laptop or a, 
or a tablet to answer them. There's no paper questionnaire. There is instead a program, and it's the program that's the metadata. So technically, at the beginning, you could start. You start with this uh, uh, computer-assisted interviewing system, and what you get out of it is the original data set. But you can also derive from it um, DDI metadata and in XML, and there are programs, uh, a couple of different programs that will take uh, these uh, CAI systems, the code that they run on, turn them into XML. But what happens next? Well, um, what happens next is that the project that, cr that commissioned the data is going to modify the data. Um, there are a number of reasons for doing that. There are some things that are in the data that are just purely there for administrative purposes. There are some variables that have to be changed to reduce the identifiability of, in, of individuals, some variables that need to be combined into scales or indexes. So what they do is they write a script that's going to run in one of the major statistical packages and they take that script and the script and the, and the, the uh, data go through that uh, software and what comes out is a new data set. Well, what happens uh, to the metadata? Well, at this point, the metadata don't match the data set anymore and you would need to update the XML to uh, fix it and nobody likes updating XML, so the metadata get trashed and are thrown away. What happens then is this. When the data, after the data are uh, revised, the metadata are recreated. And what happens is that we at the archive take the revised data and extract as much metadata from it as we can, so we get an extracted XML file. And what about the, the things that went on in this script here? Well, we actually have to sit down and extract them by hand. So a person has to read the script and write down what happened. Well, what we're working on in, well, so what are we missing? Well, what we get from the, these statistics packages are just names, labels for variables, labels for, for values, and virtually no provenance information. So what we're working on is a way that we can automate the capture of this variable transformation metadata. Um, so what our idea is this, that um, we're going to write software where you could take the script that was used to modify the, the data, take the very same script, and run it through what we're calling a script parser and pull from that the information about uh, variable transformations and put that into a standard format which we're calling uh, a standard data transformation language. And then you take that information and incorporate it into the original DDI, you update the original DDI, and then you've got um, a new version of the XML that, that is in sync with the revised data. So this process then requires two, two different software tools, one that will read the script and turn it into a standard format, and a second one that will update the XML, and that's what we're building. So we're, we are building um, tools that will work with the different software packages and update XML. We're actually writing these uh, parsers for scripts in four different languages, SPSS, SAS, Stata, and R. And the reason we're doing four languages is that if you look at the column over there on the right, which is based on downloads uh, at ICPSR, in cases where the data set had all four formats, you can see that there is not a single dominant format. SPSS and Stata are the most downloaded formats from ICPSR, and they both have about 24%. SAS and R both have about 12%. If we did one package 
we wouldn't please, you know, we'd be pleasing only a few people and we couldn't have an impact. So we're actually writing parsers for four languages. Here's something I thought that's come out of our work that I, you might find interesting. And this is about why we need to have a, a, a special language for expressing these data transformations. So here are uh, three brief programs in SPSS, Stata, and SAS that all are designed to operate on the same data. And, uh, and you know, I tried very hard to make the, the uh, programs, the scripts, identical, and I think that I succeeded. But if you run these three programs, you get three different results. So, and the key thing here is to look at the last row, that the uh, row in which we set the minus one to be missing, in SPSS, you get two missing values. In Stata and SAS, one of the, the variables is, is set to a number, but it's a different one in each one. Why does this happen? Well, the reason is that in logical expressions, SPSS treats a missing value as miss, uh, makes the result of a logical expression that includes a missing value missing, which in most cases is treated as false. Stata treats a missing value as uh, a number which is equal to infinity. SAS treats a missing value as a number which is equal to minus infinity. So both Stata and SAS actually do uh, uh, return a number when you have one of these comparisons. So it's actually more accurate to represent the data in this way, which you wouldn't see if you just, you know, looked at, at the data set. So what we're doing is creating our own language where we're actually using a language that's been created by another community, the uh, SDMX com community called Validation and Transformation Language, so that we can put all three of these languages into a common core. So what are we doing and why are we doing it? So the goal of the, the project um, is, is to capture this metadata and automate it. If we can capture more metadata from uh, the data creation process, you know, we'll be able to provide much better information to, to researchers about what's in the data set. Automating this process, we hope, will um, make it cheaper for everyone and make it easier. And that has been one of the principles that we've tried to do here, that you know, if we can't make, make it easier for the researchers, they're not going to do it. So the hope here is that uh, the software we get will uh, make, that, make their lives easier. And uh, here's just to, to acknowledge my, uh, so my partners in this. We've got uh, partners from a couple of uh, software firms, Collectica and Metadata. Technology North America, the Norwegian Center for Research Data, um, and two of the, the two projects I mentioned, the General Social Survey and the American National Election Study are part of the project too. So that's my talk. Fabulous. Thank you very much, George. We had a question that came through earlier in your talk when you were um, speaking about people um, putting variables into ICPSR and searching for for them, uh, and Ming has asked, when a user searches for a variable or variables, do they need to come up with the exact variable name as in the um, variable index? So uh, right now what we're, what we're doing is really a text search. And when you search for variables, you're searching over um, the variable name and the variable label. Um, and it also can can bring up items that are in the values for the variables. But one of the problems in the social sciences is that um, people don't reuse questions very often. So we don't have a, a, a tradition of reusing questions. Um, and it's very hard to find the same question in multiple data sets. Um, the kind of search we're doing now in in uh, our question bank is frankly kind of clunky and it often misses, misses things and 
that's uh, an issue that uh, I'm trying to address in some other projects where we're trying to, to improve the way we, we can search over variables. Thank you very much. We've got a question for Nick as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick, we've got a question. How widely is PROV used and what have you found to be the main challenges working with PROV, noting that a V2 is not on the horizon? Is it easy to update a PROV model if a change is required? Okay, so first part first, how widely is it used? Um, so my, I have a direct interest in things provenance, but aside from that I have an interest in things geospatial and uh, I guess physical sciences data. In that community there's only one game in town, that's really PROV, uh, but it's early days. So most of the spatial, geophysical, blah, blah, blah sorts of places, that those hard physical sciences side, um, they either are using their own systems or they're intending to use PROV. There's not many that are actually already using PROV, but there are certainly not many that are intending to use something other than PROV. Um, outside of my own Geoscience Australia area, um, other communities I know of, including DDI and so on, uh, because PROV has only been around for a few years, um, if people can characterise their problem in a provenance way, like they actually understand this as a provenance question as opposed to a, uh, some other kind of question like an ownership or an attribution question, um, they, they fairly quickly end up at prov. Um, so I think it's it's about as, it, it's certainly more widely used than any other provenance standard has ever been and it's showing signs of being much more widely used than that and that's because any other initiatives in the space have been sort of swallowed up by prov. Now, well, the second part of the question was, uh, what are the problems? And I've identified one already, which is people have to know that they're asking a provenance question. So we get a lot of questions which are synonyms for uh, provenance questions, probably much like variable naming, uh, where people say, I'm interested in the lineage of my data, or the transparency, or the process flow, or um, the ownership, or attribution. Um, and those are all, or could be all, provenance questions. Um, the hardest thing is to, to work out is, um, uh, specifically what questions are being asked um, and then if there is an existing uh, metadata model or something in that space already, what's it doing and what's it not doing um, and therefore do we need provenance, a specific provenance initiative. So for instance, many met metadata models have authorship, ownership, creator in, uh, information indicated in them. So if your provenance question is, I want to know data sets created by Nick, that kind of provenance question you can usually answer in, in other metadata systems. You would have to have something a bit more complicated than that um, and, and term it provenance uh, to then think about using the provenance system. The other thing is the move away from what I call uh, point metadata where you've got a single thing with a bunch of properties that come from it. So a, a study or a document or a chunk of data with a bunch of properties, that's one way to do things, but what PROV and what other models are interested in is whole networks. Things are related to other things. It's more complex but it's much, much more powerful to do that. Great, thank you very much. So a question for George, how is sensitive data variables or values controlled for during the C2 automatic capture? ICPSR has a confidentializing service on ingest. Is this process carried over to the C2 metadata project? Is this activity captured in prov-like metadata? So the, um, the C2 metadata uh, model is to operate solely on the metadata, uh, not on the data. Um, so that's really a, so it doesn't really play into the issue of uh, confidentiality. If you're interested, in two weeks we're going to have another webinar where I am going to talk about uh, how we manage uh, confidential data. But in general, it's it's rarely the case that we have to mask the metadata uh, of a of a data set for confidentiality reasons. Obviously, controlling the data is something else. So we've got another question here for George. Um, your script parser that reads from SAS script, do researchers need to, would they need to install that in their SAS package? Uh, we haven't gone to that point yet, but probably not. Probably what we'll do, at least as a starting point, is offer it as a web service. And what you'll do is simply export your uh, SAS program into a, a text file and upload the text file to the um, uh, to the web server web service and it will download a new uh, uh, XML file. So 
So we've got another question here. Does PROV support the workflow of creation and approval of provenance data, e.g. the PROV entry is proposed and has been submitted to the data custodian for approval? That's got two kind of answers to it. One is a generic PROV answer and the other one seems to be more in line with a particular repository doing a particular set of steps. So um, this isn't exactly what you asked, but I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way. You can talk about the provenance of provenance, which is a bit tricky, uh, but say you had say you had information about the, the, the lineage or the history of a data set um, and you wanted to control that chunk of stuff. You could talk about that thing being a data set itself, even though it's about something else, and manage that. Um, and you could certainly work out how to link your data set to the data set that contains its provenance information. So you can do that. Um, but the second part of the question, or I think the general sense of the question, is more to do with how does a specific repository do things. Is that, does that make sense? Uh, does the prov su support the workflow of creation and approval? Oh, okay, in general, you can represent anything in prov uh, because it's really high level and it's got those three generic classes of entity, activity, and agent. And there's almost nothing in the world that I've come across that you can't decompose down into one of those three things. Is it a thing, is it a causative agent, or is it a temporal occurrence? Um, so in general modeling workflows, yes. Okay, fabulous. And so Natasha asks, philosophical question for the whole panel, how do you think provenance relates to trust? So I'm going to just jump in very quickly and say, um, provenance models before prov often had the word trust in them somewhere. Um, and, and many of the, the motivations for provenance models were to do with trust uh, we deal with trust uh, as the, the, the goal of Geoscience Australia to put out data and make it open and transparent. It's fundamentally a trust issue for users of that data. They want to know how did, how did this data come into being. Um, so, that's, that's, so that's really what Provence is about. It's about telling about the history of something so you can, you can generate all this uh, data trust. Um, uh, then the specifics of what you put in there, uh, you can work out, do I trust the people who created this thing? Do I trust the, the process that was undertaken to, to deal with it or transform it? Uh, do I trust the particular chunks of code that were used? Um, so, so that's the generic answer. Um, then there's the sort of more specific ones like um, uh, for data in this repository, how do I trust that it's, even though you're telling me something about it, that it's in fact true? Um, there are also very difficult things about how do I actually trust this metadata, even if it looks like it's all correct. This data comes from God, delivered to you on a stone tablet. Um, I could write that down, but is it true? Uh, you have to work that out. That's a, that is a now non provenance thing. You have to work out some other way of, of attributing a trust metric to that claim. And that might be that it's digitally signed and you trust the agency that delivered it, so that's an appeal to authority. Uh, you might trust that there is enough information pre present for you to understand the process enough to have confidence in it. Uh, you might, it might link to well-known sources like open code or something like that that you trust. Um, or maybe there's a mechanism for you to validate certain chunks of data or calculations. So the total number was five and you can look back to the provenance and see somewhere two plus three, and you see five, that, that you can calculate and you can establish that trust directly. So I think uh, Nick, Nick said it very well, but uh, let me, I'll say the same thing in, in fewer words. That, that <laughs> yeah, thanks, George. That, that, that <laughs> provenance is, is really fundamental to trust. And Nick really hit, it on, hit the nail on the head when he talked about transparency. That provenance is about transparency. And in the world we live in now, even appeals to authority don't work very well anymore. Um, and I think that for for science to to have to gain legitimacy and gain trust, we have to be transparent, and that's what what provenance metadata is all about. So we've reached the end of our um, time, uh, and I'd just like to thank our three speakers for coming along uh, to our Cam Anne's Canberra office today and um, speaking to us about provenance and introducing lots of new acronyms to us all. Um, every time I in, uh, encounter anything new at ANS, there's always more acronyms to learn. Um, so thank you very much for coming. We uh, have two more webinars in the Social Science series, so hope to see you there again. <laughs>